Good afternoon, we are on Sunday the 29th of May 2022. I'm going to be sharing with you part five, the fourth chamber, A Heart That Burns for God's Return, and the book is by Jeremy McQuoid, How to Set Your Heart on Fire and Not Just on Sundays. A call to passionate Christian living. This is for all Christians, no matter which denomination. How do we keep our hearts burning for God in an apathetic culture? By giving ourselves to the passions of God. Jeremy McCoyd uses the illustration of the four chambers of the heart to outline the four chief passions of God that need to be the driving force in our lives. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom his love commits me here, ever this day be at my side to light and guard, to rule and guide. Amen. Holy Michael Archangel, defend me in this day of battle. Be our safeguard against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, I humbly pray, and do thy prince of the heavenly host, by the power of God, thrust down to hell, Satan and all the wicked evil spirits who wander through the world for the ruin of souls. Amen. Chapter 10's title and there's a few during the, the chapter. The title is, Jesus is coming again. Matthew 24 verse 42. Keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. And the words of the author continue. As I look out of my office window this morning, there is nothing but the faintest breeze in the air. Leaves on the trees that adorn my view are limp. The deeside hills in the background look as sturdy and fixed as the day God formed them at the dawn of creation. The only sound that invades the peace of this scene is the occasional passing car. It is hard to imagine on a day like today that Jesus is coming back again and we are heading for a cosmic meltdown. But any serious reader of the Bible cannot escape the conclusion that God's story still awaits its final chapter. What has been set in motion through the cross and the invasion of Satan's territory by the kingdom of God is crying out for a conclusion. The people of God, being gathered from every nation under the banner of Christ's blood, still live in a world that is under God's curse. Genesis 3. We await the consummation. Our aching limbs long to be clothed with immortality. Our aching souls all too aware of our ongoing failings long to be perfect like Christ. Even the world around us, the physical creation itself, abused by industrialists and pollution, deliberate pollution, geoengineering and poisoning the skies and poisoning the land, sorry author that's not in the book but I've added it, is groaning for the one who will establish a new heavens and a new earth, the home of righteousness, 
and I hope none of those polluters exist at that time. There is something missing from our burning hearts if we are longing for God's glory, the first chamber of the heart, pining for God's people, the second chamber, witnessing to God's world, third chamber, but are not yearning for the day Jesus will come to reign, fourth chamber, an enormous amount of intrigue and speculation has surrounded this heart-pounding thought of the return of Christ. The purpose of this chapter is not to rehash views on millenniums, tribulations, beasts with ten heads or who I, the author, think the Antichrist might be. And Jeremy McCoy said, my former physics teacher is probably too old to make a serious impact on world history now, so is out of the running. In any case, the endless speculation about the last times often hides the most important truths that we need to know about the issue. Jesus will come unexpectedly. We should be longing for his coming. All this getting ready for the Queen. We should be getting ready for Jesus. The Queen will be gone before us and hopefully he might return before she goes. Who knows? Jesus will come unexpectedly. We should be longing for his coming. And we need to be ready to meet him. These are the issues that will dominate this chapter 10. The return of Christ is fundamental. The return of Christ to the earth is as fundamental to Christianity as the cross and the resurrection. Some liberal theologians may have placed doubts on the nature of his coming. I don't know what is coming in a minute, but in my understanding of the Bible, we won't be able to miss it. <laughs> Wherever we are in the world, we won't be able to miss his coming. It's described in the Bible, so we will all be given eyes to see. <laughs> so nobody will miss it. That's what I believe. It's not what I'm re reading. I'm going to get back to here. Some liberal theologians may have placed doubts on the nature of his coming, suggesting that it is more a mystical, no, it's going to be everything, spiritual experience than a physical reality. No, no, no. It has to be the way it's written. However, the New Testament is categorical that Jesus will return to the earth on some future day in real space and time. But he'll look glorious, that's the difference. He won't look like, like as you see him in the, in the film The Passion of the Christ or all the other Jesus movie, films, movies. He'll come back visibly that is the clear implication of the message of the angels at the beginning of the book of Acts. In fact, it is the message of the angels convincing the disciples that Jesus will come again. That is the introduction to all urgent public witnesses of the church throughout the book. While the disciples are standing on the mountain with open mouths, seeing Jesus' resurrected body literally disappear, 
from view behind the clouds suddenly two men in white appear beside them that's in acts 1 verse 10 the message of the angels is difficult to misinterpret why do you stand there looking up at the sky this same jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven acts 1 10 and 11. this verse is not just saying that jesus is coming back again it is saying that he will come back again in the same way he left our world two thousand years ago he will be seen coming through the clouds in the sky his glorious return has no mysticism about it Luke is clearly not saying that Jesus's return will just be an intangible spiritual experience Jesus will be visible and literal a real historical event we should all bow down not that we needed acts to tell us that Jesus had already spelt it out several times in the Gospels even when he was under the most intense pressure at his trial in the future you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven Matthew 26 verse 64 again the emphasis is on you will see you will see you will see Jesus second coming will not be some hidden private event like his first coming that was shared with just a handful of shepherds and some eastern astrologers his second coming will be the most visible public event that god has ever unleashed before humanity's eyes in the history of the world no one saw god create the world every eye will see the glorious return of Christ Matthew 24 suggests that all the nations of the earth will be caught up <coughs> excuse me <coughs> excuse me with his coming excuse me I must have a sip of this drink my neighbor gave me it's not very but it's a, a shandy I think In fact, it's taken me hours to drink that much, <coughs> but I have to because the throat. Sorry, my apologies. At that time, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the nations of the earth will mourn they will see the son of man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory Matthew 24 verse 30 God wants the whole world to see the coming of Christ because that will be the full un unveiling of Christ's glory and power. The hiddenness of God's kingdom will be removed forever. All people will see Jesus for who he truly 
is. In our day of advanced satellite systems and internet technology, it is possible like never before for the whole world, the whole earth, to see Jesus coming in the clouds of heaven at the same time. I believe that for the simple reason, it seems a silly, it's not in the book, a silly comparison, but I didn't want to miss the summing up of the Johnny Depp um, defamation case. I've been following it live on my computer and missing sharing with you because of it. And uh, as I was walking along, I'd left it on the phone, smartphone on, because I'd been in a cafe and had breakfast. And I turned it on there. People were amused but interested. And uh, I just put it in the phone case in the trolley. And as I'm going along the streets of my hometown, I could hear the rest of it being all discussed. So I just sat down at a bus stop opposite what used to be the Salvation Army. It now sells roses. I heard everything so clearly. This is Downer Market, Norfolk, England, I sat. And that recording, and you could see it, whatever was going on as well, was in America. Virginia, I think the court is in, isn't it? And I just sat there for a very long time following everything just the same as I was at home watching on my computer. So when Jesus comes back, who knows how, but people will. They will be able to see Jesus wherever they are on the earth. Because if I don't find that unbelievable, I find it very believable. Who knows what advances when? From then, there, there is nobody who won't see it. That's my belief anyway. Everyone will know. Everyone. <laughs> so, whether it's satellite or him doing it somehow, we will see him. And the next title, Jesus will return suddenly not any advance notification. He'll just appear magically or spiritually or glo to glory to God. Jesus will not only appear visibly, he will also return suddenly. While there will be certain signs that will point to his coming, listen to this, this is biblical, wars and rumours of wars, earthquakes, famines, the worldwide spread of the gospel, and so on in Matthew 24. Well, everything in here, apart from the famines, is not. The famines are coming and they're on their way and they're hitting some places. But the famines that they're talking about are going to be very, very serious ones. Um, but everything else is accurate. We have a war going on in Ukraine and other little wars all over the world. The most serious rumour of all is if they don't stop what they're doing, we're heading to a World War Three, which will mean nuclear devastation of the planet. It, if they don't stop messing about the way they are, it's so wrong. All of these big powers are wrong. All of them. So, that's what's going to happen. The only thing is, I believe the famines are going to be terrible. That's not written here, but they're going to be terrible. So we, we could expect Jesus on the orders of the Father whenever, any time, because we don't know their heart. They might not want the destruction of the world by nuclear and all this other stuff. They might not want that. They don't want it anyway, but, you know, they're giving us enough rope to hang ourselves 
free will and free choice and all of that. Evil people controlling under the auspices of Satan himself. Basically, Jesus coming will catch everyone by surprise, including you and me. Paul points to the kind of atmosphere that will pervade people's minds on the day Christ comes. A reading from 1 Thessalonians 5, 2 and 3. The day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, while people are saying, peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labour pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. So anyone who's been pregnant as I have, it does come on you. You're expecting, you have a date, but even on the day, you're never too sure until it really begins and then you know that's it. Ooh. It is an atmosphere of peace and safety that will be filling people's hearts when Jesus comes again. They will not be expecting it. Matthew compares the suddenness of Jesus coming to the day when God closed the door of the ark before the flood literally swept people off their feet in Noah's day. Life was very much continuing as usual. Yes, there were warnings from the crazy old man who was building the mother of all boats when there had been no rain for months. But other than that, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Matthew 24 verse 38. Life was continuing as normal, just like the view from, this is the author speaking, from my office this morning, all was peace and safety, as it is from my window. I've got a lovely garden out there, which I can look at. And then in an instant, cosmic calamity, the destruction of every living creature on the face of the earth, apart from those who were safe inside the wooden boat that God had prepared for their salvation. And Jeremy McCoy said, as I sit here today, there are soldiers in Iraq. An earthquake has recently caused two tsunami waves to devastate Southeast Asia. And a hurricane in the States has brought a superpower to its knees. Despite how normal everything looks from my office, many of the signs of Jesus coming are already here and my peace and quiet could be interrupted at any moment by cosmic catastrophe. And I say a second to that because it's true. I was just mentioning to you the only thing missing at the moment are serious famine. I believe it has to be serious famine because you see, we know there's food shortage and we know that the prices are going up and all that sort of thing, but they're not really kicking in much yet. So it's when you see those horrific pictures that we used to see coming out of Africa of starvation. When those start, I don't have a television, but when you start seeing all those things on your television and those dreadful starvation of, of, of poor people, in the you know the third world countries that still exist they have rich and poor but very poor when you see all that coming you, you you it's one of the signs because all the rest that we've been told will be happening are already slowly happening and increasing day by day they're not going away they want to continue it power power and control of the world and the world's resources that's what it's all about it's about economics they don't want to share they want to own the few that are owning are trying to destroy the rest of us it's 
true. They were offered wealth by Satan. They're going through. Jesus will return personally. It is this image of Jesus returning as a thief in the night that is really worth considering. Four times the New Testament compares Jesus' return to a thief in the night. Luke 12, verse 39 and 40. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 2. 2 Peter 3, verse 10. Revelation 16, verse 15. Such a colourful image points to an element of surprise. But there is no there is more to this image than meets the eye. More than that, the thought of suddenness or surprise. It is the idea of being caught unawares. When a robber invades your private space, when he rifles through your personal belongings, when he leaves you feeling insecure and afraid. I was speaking, this is um, Jeremy McCoyd, I was speaking last week to a member of my church whose house had just been broken into. What struck me was that she was not concerned about the monetary value of the things that had been taken by the thieves. There was nothing that she could not replace or claim insurance on. But she was much more perturbed that someone had been in her private home. Her safe place was no longer safe. Her personal affairs had been disturbed as drawers lay opened and photograph, fame, photograph frames of family smashed. You see, it is not just that Jesus will come at a time when few people are expecting him, but that his return will be very personal. That is surely one of the feelings the New Testament wants to give us through this image of a thief in the night. Jesus will be coming to rifle through the private things in your life and mine that we thought no one else knew about or would ever discover. His coming will bring with it a personal examination. Imagine going through all that Johnny Depp and Amber Heard have just gone through. I mean, can you imagine all your dark secrets or my dark secrets being brought out by one another in a courthouse situation? Well, it won't be. It'll be, it'll be between us and God and everyone watching and hearing what we've done that we thought we'd got away with throughout our lives all that we're ashamed of because we've changed because God changed us remember that God changes us it's not in the book all this God changes us when we allow him to come in when we allow Jesus and the Holy Spirit to take over us we change from being a sinner so if you're not a Christian and you happened on this video now is the time to turn to God. Repent of your sins, they'll be washed away in the blood of Jesus. And you're a new creation in Christ. Yes, your sins will be shown to one another when God judges us. But then we'll all be in the same boat. But it won't be very nice, will it, having all your sins brought out like they were in, this, in America recently. I, I feel sad for them, I've prayed for them because Johnny Depp at the end of the day whatever the verdict is God will still require him to forgive her if he wants to be forgiven any of his sins or all of his sins no matter 
no matter what it, it, we have to forgive all those who've hurt us and hurt us greatly and um, she has to repent and be sorry and ask God to heal her she needs deep healing mental, psychological, spiritual she was a Catholic she now an atheist for since she's a teenager yes terrible things happen to her she needs dreadful healing only the healing that god can give that jesus can give but she's rejected it but she will she will have to turn she will have to turn because her life is going to be completely different after this is all over whether she wins or loses she's lost because if she wins Oh, sorry it's not in the book if she wins on one count of abuse that they prove against I don't mean sexual abuse or physical abuse but abuse abuse is verbal emotional so if she wins on one count of the verbal he, he, he has done to her the verbal or the emotional she wins the case she only needs one win Yet he has been abused dreadfully, dreadfully, but it really depends on the jury and what real justice is, because it would have been 50-50 with both abusing one another emotionally and verbally. But the sexual and physical is different. She's admitted hitting him. So anyway, we have to worry about our sins, not somebody else's sins. And we have to be sorry for our own sins. And long before Jesus comes, get right with God now and try and stay with him. Because he's here with us. But not in the visible, physical. He's here right now. So... I must find where I left off when I got <laughs> taken aside. I do apologise for that. Right. Such a wonderful, a colourful image points to an element of surprise. But there's more to this image than meets the eye. More than that, the thought of suddenness or surprise. It is the idea of being caught unawares when a robber invades your private space, when he rifles through your personal belongings, when he leaves you feeling insecure and afraid. Oh, I've read that before, so I'll go further down. You see, it is not just that Jesus will come at a time when few people are expecting him, but that his return will be very personal. That's where I stopped, isn't it, and ranted. That is surely one of the feelings the New Testament wants to give us through this image of a thief in the night. Jesus will be coming to rifle through the private things in your life and mine that we thought no one else knew about or would ever discover. His coming will bring with it a personal examination, an uncovering of inner motives, our deepest heart desires, our darkest ambitions. That is the feeling that a woman has when she returns home to discover there has been a break-in. The invasion of privacy is more unsettling in many ways than the unexpected timing of the visit. The next title, An Invasion of Privacy. The coming again will ultimately be an invasion of privacy. Jesus will expose our hearts for what they truly are. Evil will be exposed for what it truly is. 
not just the outrageous public evil of a Hitler or a Stalin, but the socially acceptable private evil of an immoral, immoral, amoral lifestyle being lived out without any thought or fear of the Lord. That means breaking all the Ten Commandments, but at different times or maybe all at the same time. <sighs> being lived out without any thought or fear of the Lord. In fact, one of the videos this week that I did um, on the marginalised, the prayers, the marathon prayer one, I did record the corporal works of mercy and the spiritual um, works of mercy, the Ten Commandments and all the teachings of the Catholic Church, all the things we have to, many people don't know because they haven't been taught properly since uh, a Vatican II. So they're all out there. The other day in that 130 pages, I think I recorded. So they're out there if people don't know what their, what their, what sins and things. But this invasion of privacy will not just be for the world, it will begin with the church. God will judge his own Peter people as Peter himself declares, and that means the Pope get judged. It is time for judgment to begin with the family of God. 1 Peter 4 verse 17. Just imagine the moment when we are at last caught up into the presence of Christ and are presented in front of his judgment, his judgment seat at the end of time. Many Christians appear to be unaware that they will face a judgment, a judgment seat on the last day. They think to themselves, has Christ not dealt with every area of judgment in my life? Do I not have a free ticket to heaven on account of the cross? No. No, definitely not. But many think they do. They think after they've accepted Christ that they're, that's the, the straight way of the ticket and that's all they've got, got to worry about. Yes, of course, you do. Not that the ticket is really free, it cost Jesus untold agony and separation from his father during three hours of intense darkness. It cost him the immeasurable anguish of being perfect, yet being presented to the father as everything that is vile and deplorable an eternity's weight of sin, of murder, rape, lies, hatred, gossip, slander, adultery, placed to Jesus' account under the angry eyes of God. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 what a beaten, broken, slandered, bloodied, beautiful, humble, courageous, incomparable, world-winning, eternity-swinging saviour. But yes, you and I have a free ticket. This is the beauty of the gospel and the wonder of God's grace to us. That beautiful word, atonement, means that Jesus has perfectly and fully covered 
our sins in the eyes of God. We will never have to answer for our rebellion. What we need to realize is that the scriptures refer to two different judgment seats. One is the great white throne mentioned in Revelations 20. The issue at the great white throne will be the eternal salvation of men and women. This awesome chapter depicts the opening of the book of life. The Book of Life contains the names of all those who have been saved by the blood of Christ. As the Book of Life is opened in front of a vast multitude at the end of time, judgment is pronounced. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life. He was thrown into the lake of fire. Revelations 20 verse 15. However awesome and stark the great white throne and the lake of fire might be, no true believers will find themselves there. Our hell is paid for. Or to put it another way, Christ has entered the fire of God's wrath for us. At the cross he fully tasted the lake of fire on our behalf as our sacred substitute so we cannot be touched by it. Excuse me a moment. the judgment seat of Christ. But there is another place of judgment that the New Testament describes. Paul refers to the judgment seat of Christ in 2 Corinthians 5. Paul is clearly talking to Christians. He is encouraging them that their earthly bodies are just temporary dwellings, like a tent. One day when they die, their spirits will leave their tents and be caught up to be with Christ. What a moment of joy that will be for Christ, the Christian. But he ends the thought with a more somber one. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive what is due to him or her for the things done while in the body whether good or bad 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10 the issue at the judgment seat of Christ will not be the eternal salvation of our souls but God wants to know what we have made of the lives he has given us of the grace he has poured out on us of the gifts he has planted within us the bar is raised at the judgment seat of Christ as Christians we are such privileged people. We have been let in on the meaning of life, which remains such a mystery to the majority of our planet. We have been given the gift of the Holy Spirit, who comes alongside us to promote the character of Jesus in our personalities. So, this isn't in the book, you should be able, if I'm living right, to see Christ coming through me to you. You should be able to realise that Christ and his Holy Spirit of God lives in me 
and that the words that reach you come not from me, they're words that God is talking through me to you, if you understand what I mean. Because I pray before I read to you or pray with you or pray for you, I pray that you will not hear Janet's voice, but the voice of God, the Holy Spirit, Jesus himself too, if you understand. Anyway, I'll continue. So. We have been given the gift of the Holy Spirit who comes alongside us to promote the character of Jesus in our personalities. Rome, Romans 8, 1 to 17. We have been entrusted with the gospel. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 1. We have been brought into the international family of God who for all their imperfections share the same hope we share and spur us to onwards love and towards love and good deeds Hebrews 10 24 to put it crudely God is looking for a good return on his investment if we have dribbled away our lives in pointless apathetic living he will not keep us out of heaven. My ticket to heaven depends on Jesus' merits, not mine. But he will feel it, and we will feel it at the judgment seat. Paul uses a compelling image to describe how our lives will be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. The fire will test the quality of each man's work. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 13 Just as fire tests the purity and values of a metal, so God's fire will test the purity and value of our lives. Fire is searching. It is burning. It uncovers and reveals the true character of the metal. The judgment seat of Christ will be the moment of truth for us. The most rigorous examination of our motives, the most intricate testing of our life's work, the most exacting measurement of our zeal. This kind of rigorous testing is happening already, of course. Jesus' fiery eyes are pointed at every church, every gathering of God's people, every believing heart. The letters to the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3 are really God's assessment of people. Jesus is the one with the piercing eyes at the end of Revelation 1. Who walks among the lampstands, a metaphor for the churches, and judges the value of each church's ministry. The judgment seat of Christ will simply be the final accounting of the testing Jesus has been conducting throughout our lives. The next title. The joy of the judgment seat. But we are not to imagine that this judgment seat will be a joyless event. It all depends on the quality of lives we present at his throne. For burning heart believers, the judgment seat of Christ will be a homecoming. It will be the greatest joy of their lives to hear the words from the master. Well done, good and faithful servant. Matthew 25 verse 21. When the master says, well done, as I stand before him, 
my heaven will be two heavens. It will be joyous, not just because I've passed the divine test of the all-knowing God. It will be wonderful because Jesus himself will mean everything to me on that day. As I stand in my glorified mind and body, I will have a perfect understanding of him. I will appreciate his beauty and wonder and sacrifice like never before. And I get the sense that when his fire is placed on the quality of my life's work, I will be just desperate, desperate to bring a smile to his face. I will see the nail prints in his hands. I will feel the warmth of his eyes on my soul. I will experience the full radiance of his person. To know on that day of truth that my life brings pleasure to him. That he feels I have run the race well. And being worthy to carry his name. I tell you, there will be no greater sense of elation in the universe. didn't know that was coming that they're writing I didn't I did I haven't read it before but that's how it will be that's how it will be sorry sorry oh. good thing I've got quite a few hankies here The next title The Loss at the Judgment Seat. But what if we've lived half a life? What if we've been so caught up with our careers, our hobbies, our holidays, even our husbands or wives? that Jesus has only got second best. What will the judgment seat be like then when we realise in the face of absolute truth and piercing honesty that the total product of our lives is, is worth no more than the dust that falls from a carpenter's table that is the image Paul gives of wasted Christian lives. The works of burning heart believers produce gold and silver and precious stones when they are exposed to the fire of God's testing. There is something durable, precious and even sparkling about the works of godly men and women. But the wasted lives of compromised Christians who were more interested in their bank accounts, their soccer teams, their satellite TV systems, their homes or gardens than they are in being disciples of Jesus is likened to wood, hay or straw. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 12. The judgment seat of Christ will not reveal the hidden sin in the hearts of Christians. Sin is dealt with the blushing at the throne will not be because God will display some kind of nasty video of our most carnal moments to a watching church 
who cannot believe their eyes. God is not vindictive that way, but the judgment seat will reveal waste, ungratefulness, shallowness, pure laziness. I would rather you were hot or cold, said Jesus to the Christians in Laodicea, but you are lukewarm. You are no use to anyone. See Revelation 3, 16. There will be no tears in heaven. Oh, that's, that's comforting. Revelations 21, 4. But, but, there will be a sense of loss in the hearts of believers who know they have given so very much and have made so very little of it. God's mercy will cover our sins, but it will not remove our sense of loss if we know deep down we have not lived in a manner of the Christ who hung on a cross for us. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. 1 Corinthians 3, 15. That is the end of chapter 10. Chapter 11 is the final one, I believe. And the title is Get Ready to Meet Jesus. I won't record chapter 11 today. This one, chapter 10, I think it must be the only one. It's made me very emotional. I wasn't expecting the words to <coughs> have that effect. This writer, is he really knows the, the Bible, the scriptures and God so well that I don't know, they just, his words as I read them just totally overwhelmed me. So thank you so much for listening. May God bless you and heal you. I'm sending you his peace in abundance. May you always be happy and joyful in the Lord. And I'll have a little drink. <laughs> I don't mean too much, but a drink of something. And then I will record the three daily meditations um, during the rest of the evening. Um, the time is 17.41, so I've still got time to record healing prayers for every day, daily meditations with St. Augustine and daily meditations with the Holy Spirit. So God bless you all. Thank you, Deborah, Susan, Jane, Angela, Rose, Tony. And don't forget, on the 31st, I will go live at 8 p.m. English time. That will be about 5 in the morning in Australia for Deborah, but she gets up early to pray the rosary together because we used to I used to do it live every night but I only had Misty Cat Misty Cat who died bless her um, Linda Hicks is her real name from Guildford and Deborah from Australia Queensland with others popping in and out and they chatted and then got to know one another and I, I didn't just do the rosary I did other prayers as well and I think I possibly will um, record some from this wonderful book that I have. Um, it's not a good picture of Jesus. I've got better one images on the wall, <laughs> but they've chosen that one. So I haven't done anything from this book. I have got um, 
holy face meditations that I have done, which I've got off the internet, but this is a book. So I might probably be sharing those as well as the Holy Rosary on the 31st of, of May, which is soon, isn't it? It's my brother's birthday tomorrow. He was born in 1949. I'll have to ring him up tomorrow. <laughs> He's in Cumbria. So thank you for listening and God bless you. Thank you.